Hi, I'm Ivy Schweitzer, and um, this is a talk that I gave um, at uh, Queen Mary University College London in fall 2021, entitled Shakespeare and Dickinson at the White Heat. Uh, the first part of the talk, uh, the first just few minutes, um, was cut off in the original recording, so I'm re-recording it right now, so you can see how the talk began. I want to thank um, Scott McCracken and Francesca Murray for the um, invitation to talk and the introduction. So Shakespeare and Dickinson at the White Heat. Before I was asked last summer to write a paper on the topic, I had no idea that Dickinson, like many other readers in the US of the mid 19th century, was obsessed with Shakespeare. She admired him intensely and measured herself against him, sometimes to her credit. Her letters are littered with allusions to him. For example, in 1866, after being treated for several months for severe eye strain, during which time she was prevented from reading, Dickinson tells a correspondent how she tore off the bandages and the first thing she did was read passages from Antony and Cleopatra. Her choice speaks directly to one theme of this talk, the influence on Dickinson of Shakespeare and especially Shakespeare's sonnets, because through allusions and quotations, Dickinson often cast herself as Antony to her sister-in-law, Susan's Cleopatra, in their private notes and poems. In another example, in response to an editor who in 1873 asked her for a literary contribution to his periodical, the elusive poet explained her refusal by responding somewhat cryptically, quote, he has had his future who has found Shakespeare. That's from letter 402. She seems to be saying that Shakespeare's poetry supersedes all writing, including her own, but there is a strange sense of temporality in the statement as if the future is already known and it is in the past, it is Shakespeare. Or that this long dead writer could never not be our future. What can I, a small genius living in the rural backwater of Amherst, Massachusetts, do to change that, Dickinson seems to be implying. But of course, she would do much. She would do much when after her death in 1886, her sister Lavinia finds almost 1800 poems in a dresser drawer, some of them the most haunting and affecting in the English language. Okay. Why is this not working? <laughs> Sorry. I just, there we go. Uh, strangely, we did not gain free access to these poems as Dickinson wrote them until 2013, when Harvard University launched the online Emily Dickinson archive, which contains scans of all her extant poetry manuscripts. These manuscripts have revolutionized Dickinson studies because they allow us for the first time to access the unedited Dick Dickinson, which is quite different from the edited and printed versions. Only 11 poems by Dickinson were published during her lifetime, always submitted by friends. Their eccentric grammar and punctuation were often corrected by editors. Dickinson neither titled nor numbered her poems nor prepared them for print. Instead, she grouped her fair copies in 40 hand-sewn booklets called fascicles and self-published by including hundreds of poems and letters to friends, over 500 to Susan alone. When I teach or study Dickinson, I do not use a hard copy of her poems, although I do recommend Christian Miller's edition from 2016 titled Emily Dickinson's Poems as She Preserved Them, which prints the poems in the order of the fascicles and includes her variants, which earlier editors relegated to an appendix. This is crucial because by including variant word and words and phrases in her poems, Dickinson preserves their dynamic, indeterminate, co-created nature constellating them as critic Marta Werner says, not as still points of meaning or as incorruptible texts, but rather as events and phenomena of freedom. In teaching Dickinson, I also use my own digital labor of love, White Heat, Emily Dickinson in 1862, a weekly blog on important themes in Dickinson's creative life for one of the miraculous years in which she was writing at her incandescent creative peak. 
Online resources such as these have changed and deepened our scholarship, and they also allowed us to teach remotely during the pandemic, an experience that will change education going forward. Here and in the US, the lockdowns reveal the sharp inequities in most of our cultural institutions, from healthcare to housing to work and education, highlighting what we in the academy have known for a while that the 20th century knowledge project, <clears throat> which sustained modernity, is steeped in colonialism, imperialism, and patriarchy, is deeply flawed and needs to be rethought. And this includes its institutions like libraries, museums, and the academy itself. In her recent book, Generous Thinking, A Radical Approach to Saving the University, Kathleen Fitzpatrick argues that we need to recover the lost humanistic values of the university often housed in the humanities. She advocates rejecting the corporatizing of higher education and engaging in what she calls non-market relations of care that promote equity and inclusion, open access to knowledge and social justice. These are areas in which digital humanities can play a crucial role. And the example I would give is um, the project that I did uh, during the pandemic year when I collaborated with the three colleagues from my home institution, Dartmouth College, uh, that Francesca mentioned in the introduction called Homeworks. Um, oops, there we go, well, well. Sorry, I seem to have, it was supposed to be another slide there, but it didn't show up. Um, what Homeworks does um, is it offers students, example of student work for studying what 19th century women writers can teach us about staying at home. Dickinson was the queen of self-quarantine, using self-exile in her father's house as a form of self-protection and psychological survival. She could do this because she was of an elite class and often had household help. I use this digital project's exploration of transatlantic Victorian domesticity as an opportunity to lift up other usually occluded voices with non-elite and non-Western experiences of home. In my module titled Divergent Domesticities, I put Dickinson into conversation with two contemporaries, Lucy Larkham, a working class writer from New England who started publishing poetry as a tween worker in the Lowell, Massachusetts text textile mills, and Sarah Winnemucca, a member of and spokesperson for the Northern Paiute tribe who were forcibly removed by the US government from their ancestral homelands in what is now the state of Nevada. We need to study these women's very different experiences of home and domesticity. But what does this have to do with Shakespeare, who currently does not lack for cultural airtime and can be construed as a colonizing force all his own, you might be asking. There is a special power when our cultural icons reveal human possibilities that have been occluded or demeaned and thus speak to our contemporary moment in ways they and we could not imagine. When Shakespeare found, as Dickinson said, is our future. Let's see if we can get the slide. As I began my re research, I read the most crucial critical work on Dickinson and Shakespeare by um, Parrick Finnerty. Um, this is an encyclopedic study from 2009 titled Emily Dickinson's Shakespeare, and it puts her obsession in a wide and deep literary historical context. It seems Dickinson's contemporaries were also obsessed with Shakespeare's work in their schooling, theater, theater going newspapers, public lectures, reading clubs, and literary periodicals, almost to the point of claiming him as one of their own. Finnerty details Shakespeare's particular appeal to women, but finds that Dickinson identified not with his noble and heroic female characters, but with his most transgressive, including Queen Margaret and Lady Macbeth, and in the racially charged atmosphere of the US 19th century with his most controversial character, Othello. This was all news to me. I recalled only one instance in which I associated Shakespeare with Dickinson. I was advising a student writing her senior honors thesis on the word bliss as it occurs across the 17 poems in Dickinson's fascicle number 18, which she put together sometime in 1862. In those poems, I heard echoes of Shakespeare's famous devastating sonnet 129, which begins, the expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. 
And I began researching, as I began the researching the connection, I fell down a rabbit hole chasing this lead. In the messy process of my investigations, I, I tried, which I described below, I try to practice a form of generous thinking that Fitzgerald recommends to help us begin to renovate our field. Now, digital rabbit holes produce what psychologists call confirmatory bias. That is, as you search the web, you are grabbed by an algorithm, which have been proven to be race and gender biased. This algorithm offers you information confirming your point of view, thus digging you deeper and digging us all deeper into the ide ideological silos that divide us. To combat this, I try to keep in mind an essay by Stephen Ramsey I assigned to students with a title they adore. The Herm... Oh, no, so there's that slide about homeworks. We're going to go to Stephen Ramsey. Um, this is the title, the, Hermene the Hermeneutics of Screwing Around, or What You Do with a Million Books. Ramsey argues that while we all want some coherent authoritative path through what is known, a more creative approach is to just screw around, that is, not to know what one is looking for, but to browse, which Bra Ramsey calls, quote, one of the most venerable techniques in the life of the mind. Though these divergent approaches are not specific to the web, the web has monumentally facilitated both. The linear, prescripted institutional search in which, as Ramsey metaphorizes, quote, the wheel ruts of your roaming intellect are increasingly deepened by habit, training, and preconception, or the less programmatic browsing, and it's no coincidence that computer navigational interfaces are termed browsers, Browsing produces what Ramsey calls, citing Roland Barthes, the bliss of anarchy, of discovering what we did not already know. Browsing thus facilitates a rather Dickinsonian practice of becoming, which Ramsey dubs the screwmenutical hermit imperative, a snarky oxymoronic invitation to community relationship and play. I'm interested in this bliss because it is key, a key term in both Dickinson and Shakespeare, and because we all need a little more bliss in our lives right now. So Ramsey's screwmenutical imperative also conforms to one of Kathleen Fitzgerald's striking aspects of generous thinking that could help us transform the academy. This is the anti-capitalist anti practice of not producing more and more knowledge, but of, quote, lingering with ideas that are in front of us, rather than continually pressing forward to where we want to go, and perhaps arriving somewhere new and unexpected. Thus, I want to linger with ideas about Dickinson and Shakespeare's sonnets that have been succinctly articulated by others. So just a quick catch up for those of you not familiar with the sonnets, they were published in 1609 when Shakespeare retired in comfort to Stratford. Whether he authorized their publication is open to debate, but their arrangement in this first edition has generated a narrative about Shakespeare's love life that has caused scandal and endless debate. That story goes something like this. The first 17 sonnets advise a beautiful high-born young man to marry and produce children. The next 109 sonnets urge the poet's love for him and claim that the poems will preserve his beauty and the poem's fame. The sequence concludes with 28 sonnets, two or about a seductive dark lady who ensnares the poet in an adulterous affair and further tortures him by taking up with the fair youth. These are the poet's two loves of comfort and despair from the famous sonnet 144. While well, the editors of the Folger Shakespeare Library observed that, quote, the sonnets were only linked with, within specific clusters, that they were written perhaps over many years and perhaps two or about different people, and that only about 25 specify the sex of the beloved, they conclude wearily such facts surrender to the narrative pull of the 1609 collection. The scholarship on Dickinson and Shakespeare's sonnets is sparse but incendiary. Judith Farr, a respected Dickinson scholar, speculated in 1992 that the love triangle of the sonnets influenced Dickens' love poetry. In 2001, Kristen Comment inserted more pointedly in her essay titled Dickinson's Body, Shakespeare and Sexual Symbolism in Emily Dickinson's Writing to Susan Dickinson, 
that, quote, Dickinson has a model of homoerotic love in Shakespeare's sonnets. But she concluded, more concrete connections between sonnets and Dickinson's love lyrics are difficult to make. In his essay of 2008, titled Queer Appropriations, Shakespeare's Sonnets and Dickinson's Love Poems, Finnerty refutes this by finding many concrete connections and concludes, quote, Dickinson appropriates the sonnets, their mercantile and aristocratic imagery, their gender ambiguity and their concern with time, waste and aging and beauty to destabilize and complicate categories of gender and sexuality and to question compulsory heterosexuality and the conventional relationship between identity and desire. It's kind of a mouthful, but it kind of says it all. But it hasn't had the effect on Dickinson's studies one might expect. So let's linger a little bit and see what emerges. It's noteworthy that this essay was written after Finnerty's big book on Dickinson and Shakespeare, which only mentions the sonnet three times, the sonnets three times. One of these instances illustrates the problem I had begun to sense in my browsing. Finnerty notes how many people in the Dickinson circle owned Shakespeare calendars, which offered daily quotations from his works. He finds evidence that Susan and Emily commented on a quotation in one of these calendars from Sonnet 43 about seeing in the dark, which he then astutely reads as an intertext for Dickinson's poem, What I See Not, I Better See. So let me read these two poems to illustrate the subtle but unmistakable way Dickinson echoes and appropriates Shakespeare's gorgeous poem. Sonnet 43. When most I wink, then do mine eyes see best. I'm sorry. When most I wink, then do mine eyes best see. For all the day they view things unrespected. But when I sleep in dreams, they look on thee and darkly bright are bright in dark directed. Then thou whose shadow shadows doth make bright, how would thy shadows form, form happy show to the clear day with thy much clearer light when to unseeing eyes thy shade shines so? How would I say mine eyes be blessed made by looking on thee in the living day when in dead night thy fair imperfect shade through heavy sleep on sightless eyes doth stay. All days are nights to see till I see thee, and nights bright days when dreams do show thee me. And here's Dickinson. What I see not, I better see through faith. My hazel eye has periods of shutting but no lid has memory, for frequent, all my sense obscured, I equally behold, as someone held a light unto, the features so beloved. And I arise, and in my dream do thee distinguished grace, till jealous daylight interrupt and mar thy perfectness. It's important to note that Sonnet 43 is one of the many sonnets that does not specify the gender of the addressee or of the addresser for that matter. This would have served Dickinson well as a model for expressing forbidden desires, both adulterous and same sex, which biographers attribute to her, and for speaking as or through a male persona or an ungendered one. The sonnet hints at errant, des errant desire with its, its initial reference to winking, to things unrespected, and in the two standout phrases of homology that seem to govern the poem, shadow, shadows, and form, form. Some of Dickinson's phrasing is strongly Shakespearean. In fact, we can relineate the poem into an octave of iambic pentameter. What I see not, I better see through faith. My hazel eye has periods of shutting, but no lid has memory. For frequent, all my sense obscured, I equally behold as someone held a light unto the features so beloved. And I arise and in my dream do thee distinguished grace till je jealous daylight interrupt 
and mar thy perfectness. It's as if Dickinson could write perfectly well in the form and idiom of Shakespeare and Keats, but felt the need to break up the iambic pentameter and leave the sonnet incomplete. Finnerty cites Susan and Dickinson's exchanges through Shakespeare's poetry to reiterate the women's, quote, often complex and intricate use of Shakespeare's lines to represent, articulate, and reconfirm aspects of their lives. Finding that Dickinson put bookmarks in her edition of Shakespeare, he concludes, quote, these homemade bookmarks would transform the family's Shakespeare into the poet's secret shrine and mark sites of personal significance in the plays. What jumped out at me here was how an example from the sonnets gets obscured by and folded into the effects of the more extensive and popular plays. Although the sonnets and the plays share imagery, themes, and poetic effects, they are quite different. The plays were meant to be performed, and although, in fact, we know that's not how Dickinson experienced them, because of the historical Puritan opposition to the theater, which still lingered in rural New England in the 19th century, Dickinson might not have ever seen a production of a Shakespeare play. Her book club stage group readings of plays captured hilariously in an episode on the current TV show Dickinson, which I highly recommend, in which her brother Austin insists on cross-dressing and reading the part of Juliet. Her contemporaries preferred hearing plays read by a single famous woman actor who read all the parts. Despite their Victorian embodiment, the plays were written as performance, as a framework for group collaboration, different in every production. The sonnets were composed as poems, and though they create a dramatic narrative that unfolds over time, they are voiced by a speaker, a poet, who seems to speak in his own voice. I say seems because thanks to critics like Virginia Jackson, author of Dickinson's Misery, A Theory of Lyric Reading, and others, we are aware of the politics of the lyric as a dominating genre. Dickinson supports this critique warning in a letter to her literary interlocutor, the well-known literary editor Thomas Wentworth Higginson, quote, when I state myself as the representative of the verse, it does not mean me, but a supposed person. So there's that separation of the poet and the speaker, and that becomes important in a minute. Finnerty's speculations about the dating of Dickinson's engagement with Shakespeare also shed light on her use of the sonnets. He finds that Dickinson's references to Shakespeare in her letters occur mainly during the last 21 years of her life, concentrated in the final 10 from 1876 to 1886. There is a 12 year gap in this engagement between 1853 and 1865, when she does not explicitly refer to Shakespeare in letters. He observes that critics find references to Shakespeare in her poems insignificant and irrecoverable. And I wonder if that is because they're looking for references to the plays and not to the sonnets. In the essay on the influence of the sonnets on Dickinson, he writes after his first book, Finnerty explores many ex astonishing echoes and mostly in the poems Dickinson wrote during the years of what I call the white heat, 1861 to 63 the years in which she wrote almost a poem a day and some of her most astonishing poems. So here's where the benefits of being able to access 19th century primary documents online becomes invaluable and allows us to linger and deepen our scholarship. Browsing for Shakespeare criticism on the sonnets Dickinson might have read, I found a digital scan of a book by Anna Jameson, a widely read critic of Shakespeare, titled Memoirs of the Loves of the Poets published in Boston in 1831. In her chapter on Shakespeare, Jameson focuses exclusively on the sonnets because she claims, quote, the only writings he has left through which we can trace anything of his personal feelings and affections are his sonnets. But her search for the personal has, uh, has been predetermined. These affections need to be acceptable and edifying. Thus, in roundly rejecting the claims circulating about homosexuality or, per or perversion in the sonnets, Jameson imagines that many of the first 126 sonnets were really written to a woman who might have been Queen Elizabeth, and she asserts of the whole sequence seeming to skip over the Dark Lady series, quote, they are full of the most exquisite feelings most felicitously expressed, unquote. 
In her admiration and autobiographical reading, Jameson is seconded by another later and very popular 19th century Shakespeare critic, critic named Mary Cowden Clark, who in an essay titled Shakespeare, the Girl's Friend from 1883, holds Shakespeare up as a quote, grand aid for moral introspection, peculiarly for women, since he, the most manly thinker and the most virile writer that ever put pen to paper, had likewise something essentially feminine in his nature, which enabled him to discern and sympathize with the innermost core of a woman's heart, unquote. While the remainder of the essay dwells on female characters in the plays, Clark continues, quote, witness his sonnets where tenderness, patience, devotion, and constancy worthy of gentlest womanhood are conspicuous in combination with a strength of passion and fervor of attachment belonging to manliest manhood. While Clark's, Clark's fulsome assertion of Shakespeare's androgyny should gesture towards accepting the homosocial nature of the sonnets, all of her superlatives and gender essentialism seem to work against such a reading. By contrast, Virginia Woolf makes a full-throated assertion of androgyny as a fine and necessary capaciousness for a writer when she alludes throughout A Room of One's Own to, shake, to quote Shakespeare's mind as the type of the androgynous of the man-womanly mind, by which Woolf means citing Coleridge's definition of androgyny, that it is quote less apt to make sexual distinctions than the single-sexed mind is resonant and porous, it transmits emotion without impediment, it is naturally creative, incandescent, and undivided. Notice that allusion to white heat, it's incandescent. This is a state of mind we can imagine both Wolf and Dickinson aspiring to. And that state of mind is what I tried to imagine and conjure as I read the essay on Shakespeare's sonnets in the illustrated works of Shakespeare edited by Charles Knight and published in Boston in 1853. This is the edition Edward Dickinson bought for his family, which I was able to access digitally through the Houghton Library at Harvard University. Finnerty, who must have been able to visit this edition in person, confirms that volume seven containing the sonnets is very well used indeed. So, doesn't want to do it, there we go. So Knight begins his introduction to the sonnets by quoting Wordsworth's sonnet defending the use of the form. Quote, score not the sonnet. Critic, you have frowned mindless of its just honors. With this key, Shakespeare unlocked his heart. This summary of Shakespeare's use of the sonnet as the key to his heart essentially supports the position that these are, as Knight declares, quote, poems in which Shakespeare expresses his feelings in his own person, unquote. But to accept this position is to embrace both the homoeroticism and the self-abasement of the first 126 sonnets captured in the master mistress trope of sonnet 20 and the adultery and shame of the last 28 sonnets captured in sonnet 129. These were problematic elements of Shakespeare's work that led the critic Henry Hallam to conclude in his popular Introduction to the Literature of Europe, published in 1837, quote, it is impossible not to wish that Shakespeare had never written them, unquote. So this, 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 this critique was, was circulating. To avoid this moral dilemma, Knight decided, quote, that though they are personal in their form, not all are necessarily personal, unquote. And furthermore, that Shakespeare could not possibly have overseen the arrangement of the 1609 edition, which offers the problematic immoral narrative triangle. So Knight declares that the sonnets quote, were essentially a collection of fragments. He calls each one of them a stanza, and he decides that their arrangement had to be arbitra arbitrary because, quote, it violates the principles of art which Shakespeare clings to with such marvelous judgment in all his other productions, unquote. That is, Knight invo invokes the spotless brilliance of the plays to undermine the authorial intention of the 1609 arrangement. 
of the sonnets and to authorize his editorial interventions, which are mighty. Knight then spends the next 50 plus pages, double columns, rearranging and reprinting the sonnets into three perfect little poems in which he counts, quote, 104 sonnets, which are not offensive, unquote, and that in his mind now have a fine Shakespearean continuity. He does not offer an explanation for the remaining 50 sonnets, nor does he go as far as the 1640 edition of the sonnets, which changed the male pronouns of the beloved to female pronouns and gave the sonnets quaint titles, an edition that, by the way, became wildly popular and made the sonnets popular, but night comes very close. This radical reorganizing and even revision of poems would sound eerily familiar to anyone familiar with the dramatic, not to say contentious, bibliographic history of the publication of Dickinson's poems. After Dickinson's death, some of her poems and letters were mutilated, the names scratched out, and the pronouns changed to cover up same-sex desire. Her first editors ignored the order in which she arranged the poems in her 40 fascicles. They immediately dismembered them and rearranged them in groups with what they considered which, which what they considered a fit continuity of themes and gave them sentimental Victorian titles geared towards increasing sales. Even Dickinson's most scholarly modern ed editor, R.W. Franklin, considers the fascicles a matter of convenience, a way of organizing her poetic workshop, not a series of artistic or editorial choices. Of course, Dickinson could not have known this would happen to her poetry, but in Shakespeare's sonnets, I believe she had an example of how even intelligent and influential readers like Jameson and Knight might respond to what Finnerty calls poems of multiple eroticism that were, quote, a means of rethinking conventional categories that organize human desire and present gender disjunction that authorized and nobled same-sex passion, that's Finnerty poems that called into question heteronormative standards and traditional forms like the sonnet. In the end, I imagine Dickinson agreed with the transcendentalist sage Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said that a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. I think she recognized and rejected Knight's normalizing rearrangements of Shakespeare's sonnets as she would have resented those of the first century of editors on her own poems. Rather, in Shakespeare's celebration of male homosexual, homosocial desire, she found a model for her own gender freedom and multiple eroticisms, for her breaking the integrity of the sonnet, for her rejection of iambic pentameter. Interestingly, she transforms his dark lady into one of her favorite and most powerful poetic role models, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, about whom she wrote this extraordinary poem. I think I was enchanted when first a somber girl, I read that foreign lady, the dark felt beautiful. And whether it was noon at night or only heaven at noon, for very lunacy of light, I had not power to tell. The bees became as butterflies, the butterflies as swans approached and spurned the narrow grass and just the meanest tunes that nature murmured to herself to keep herself in cheer. I took for giants practicing titanic opera. The days to mighty meters stepped the homeliest adorned as if unto a jubilee twere suddenly confirmed. I could not have defined the change, conversion of the mind, like sanctifying in the soul is witnessed, not explained. Twas a divine insanity, the danger to be sane should I again experience. Tis antidote to turn to tomes of solid witchcraft, magicians be asleep but magic hath an element like deity to keep. This is a deeply heterodox poem, even for a lapsed Puritan like Dickinson, in which night becomes noon, giants create titanic operas, magic is like deity and sanity is dangerous. 
in the conversion of her mind, which reading Barrett Browning affects, and which a variant compares to a holy church sacrament, the speaker turns not to the scriptures, but to tomes of witchcraft. This is not a word one can use lightly in New England, which saw a horrific witchcraft craze only a mere 200 years earlier. In the way this poem revalues the dark, lunacy, magic, and witchcraft, it suggests that, like Shakespeare, Dickinson preferred the bliss-producing technique of screwing around, which also, as we know, can produce waste and shame. Data mining the sonnets reveals the word waste appears 12 times, the word shame appears 14 times, and the word bliss only once in sonnet 129, in which all three words appear to interact and deeply qualify each other. I think Dickinson responded to these word clouds when she grouped together the 17 poems she put into Fascicle 18, for which I suggested Sonnet 129 as an intertext. Many lines capture the awkward constellation of these powerful words. For example, quote, is bliss then such abyss? And tis a, an instance play, tis a fond ambush just to make bliss earn her own surprise. If I had to nominate one poem in which Dickinson Dickinsonizes Shakespeare's Sonnet 129, it might be this. My reward for being was this, my premium, my bliss, an admiralty less, a scepter, penniless, and realms just dross. When thrones accost my hands with me, miss, me, I'll unroll thee, my, my bliss, dominions dowerless beside this grace, election, vote, the ballots of eternity will show just that. Thank you. Let me stop sharing my screen. There we go. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm just going to, um, uh, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Wow. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <the> time to... <laughs> I'm going to um, pop everybody in the chat. Hi, ah, oh, Lily, Lily's got, um, I was gonna just say, if anybody's got a question, um, if anybody wants to unmute, mute, um, Lily, um, you've got a question, I think. There's one in the chat, actually, Francesca. Oh, yeah. So let's go oh, with that oh, first, it came up, just like so my hand up. Yeah, great, Di. Um, Di, would you like to ask the question yourself? Because, um, uh, can you unmute? Oh, there we go, brilliant. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, oh, it won't sound so good now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was so clever. Um, <laughs> uh, Ted Hughes he praises Dickinson's Shakespearean language, uh, her metaphor, imagery and games, but he also mentions in this piece her freakish blood and nerve paradoxical vitality of her Latinisms. I thought you might be able to explain that to me, please. Well, that's interesting because um, I, there's a blog, if you go to my, 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 blog there's a post i forget what date it's for but it's it's all on meter and it it, it, it explains all of dickinson's different meters because people don't recognize realize that she wrote free verse um and that she wasn't just tied to the hymn meter and i start off with a quotation from ted hughes because he has really written quite brilliantly about her meter and her use of meter and the the, the subtle variations and he has a really I forget what the phrase is, he has a really great phrase to discuss it, because he's really sensitive to that. On the other hand, he is not my model for a feminist, um, or someone who would recognize, um, you know, kind of <laughs> a feminist writing, as we know, having just actually taken a lovely tour with Peter Howarth and seeing um, the house that, that Plath lived in with him, and et cetera, and reliving all that. Um, so, so that's a really good question. What does he mean? I mean, there is an I would agree with him that there is a part of Dickinson that is freakish, blood and nerve, paradoxical, 
there is a, par a vitality that is paradoxically, you know, blood and nerve, but I don't understand the Latinisms part of it. Like what, what you know, I mean, she, I don't know, can you help me out here, Tom? What, what do we mean by Latinisms? Like, you know, she, 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 what do you think he means there? <laughs> I, I think it's about her word choices. And right. she, oh, she often chooses words that are Latinate. That, that, yes, and that have really clear Latin cognates. And she wants them to resonate yeah. back and forth between the Latin. I can't think of any specific examples right now, but, um, well, like immortality. You know, she really wants us to draw that out, immortality, as if she was inviting us to uh, recall the Latin roots of the word and then and then break it into pieces. I think mm. it's iconic, con iconoclastic, actually. Mm. I think she she regards Latin as the language of tombstones and she wants us to smash them as we read them. That's what I think. And so I think that's what Ted Hughes is referring to when he calls it, what does he call it? The uh, paradoxical vitality of her Latinisms. You know, I, I, would, I would add iconoclastic to that. Yeah. She's got, there's so many times in her poetry where using dashes too, she will, emphasize the Latin Latinity Ooh. of words just to invite us to go, oh, I see that and that's nonsense. Or I see that and it means something different. Well, one of the words that I think, it, and I think it's Latinate is circumference, right? Would that be a Latinate word? And that is one of, and I, I, I have a whole, I do a whole blog post on circumference because it's such a fascinating conf idea in Dickinson where she, whereas, whereas um, Emerson put the poet at the center, Dickinson was out at the edge of the circle. She was trolling that edge of the unspeakable where meaning and chaos meet. And she was, that's the edge that she trolled. And that word circumference appears in her most harrowing poems, which she's out there in the, you know, these are the poems that I love, I'm crazy poems, the existential poems. And I think that's what might be also what he's talking about. She brings us to an edge of meaning where things just yeah. start yeah. falling apart. The meaning, I don't know what these poems mean. They really start to fall apart in a way in your head. Did she study Latin at Holyoke yes, she when she was? Did yes, study Latin. Of course. Yeah. And she must have been entirely aware of how what a boys' school topic Latin was, and how it was taught as a boys' school. Topic. I think there's a paper here. <laughs> it's the com companion piece to your thing on Shakespeare is her and Latin. Latin. Yeah. But yeah. we we need we need a classicist. Who's who's going to volunteer? Not me. <laughs> Definitely not me. <laughs> but uh, does that help? Does that That's help? Really interesting. Yes, thank you both. Yeah. Thank you, Di. Thanks for a great question. Thank you. Um, Lily, do you want to kick one off unless we've got another one in the chat? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can do. Thank you so much, Ivy. That was such a fascinating talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, wow. Yeah, that question's just set my mind off in a totally different direction, I feel like. <laughs> um, but I think I was just. Um, yeah, I would thought I'd be really interested to hear a little bit more um, from you about the kind of challenge of these fast fascicles. Fascicles. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, just because I actually, I mean, I've obviously encountered her poetry before and really loved it, but never studied it that much. I actually had kind of forgotten if I ever knew that the poetry exists in this chaotic form. And I can't help see a kind of analogue between that there's a kind of like sinuousness to it isn't it like a long flowing energy um in each poem mm. and that kind of seems reflected in that form as well but it just made me think of how at the very start we were talking about trying to see the handwriting of an author and that desire right. for proximity that we have where we really want to be like as close to them as possible and then when you were talking about the editors kind of cutting and like rehashing and actually revising these poems, kind of crossing that boundary. 
I was just thinking about that contact of when you encounter a literary work, like encountering all these fascicles and um, just, yeah, what you, what it's made you, if it's made you think anything about how we can negotiate that more sensitively, I guess, that kind of like quite tactile encounter with these works, which might not have the kind of structure we expect or want. Um, and that works for illusion as well, I suppose, and that, you know, the illusions might not fit perfectly or they might not be exactly what you expect, which is kind of what you were saying with the Shakespeare illusions. Really? Um, yeah, just like, sorry, it's a bit of a <laughs> delirious comment, but. <laughs> It's a, it's a really great comment, and in fact, um, I'm I'm on a module with Peter Howarth and 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 Andrea Brady, and it's the f first year poetry module. We're introducing students to poetry, and I'm doing a lecture on 19th century American poetry, and I'm doing a section on book history, which we haven't covered yet, and I'm comparing. Um, Whitman's self-publishing Leaves of Grass in this enormous volume, and then after her death. Mabel Loomis Todd finding the fascicles, immediately cutting them up. Can you imagine that cutting them up, separating them out, organizing them, and then publishing the, the first three volumes in 1890, 91, 96, after, her, after Dickinson's death? Um, and, and, and talking about how Whitman just had so much absolute control over it to the point where he wrote positive reviews of his book and published it in the newspaper that he was editor of. <laughs> Anonymously. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's how much control he had over his marketing, his presentation. Dickinson had zero, right? To the point where if you look at her edition, there's these little flowers on the cover that make, you know, so feminine. Actually, they're corpse flowers, but, you know, so it, it, it's, it, so it's, you know, you can really see the the gender dysphoria of, of the 19th century in terms of publication, which is why I think Dickinson said, screw that, I'm not publishing. They're just going to mess me up. They're just going to censor me and correct me, and they don't understand where, what I'm doing. So she put that, so the, I think that's why she, organized her poems in these booklets, right? Because, and, and what's interesting is that she repeats poems in certain booklets, which makes us think that the booklets had an internal consistency that she was after, right? Because why repeat a poem if you've got it in fascicle three, why put it in fascicle 12, right? I mean, if it's just to keep your poems organized. So we think that the fascicles had an, an, an integrity but it, but it's amazing how the first thing the editor did, Mabel did, was cut them apart. Mm -hmm. And yeah. apparently, R. W. Franklin, he reconstructed them and redated them. She never dated anything, not even her letters. And he apparently was looking at the direction in which the needle went in the paper to figure out, you know, what page fit onto because she folded them in a certain way. I mean, it's it's mind boggling. Yeah. So, so what so what I'm and what I've been obsessed with lately is this the EDA, the Emily Dickinson Archive, which is at Harvard University puts it out. You can look at all the scans of her manuscripts and you can read her poems, not in printed version, which is not how she wanted them read. Mm -hmm. She wanted them read in manuscript version. And what happens in the manuscripts is the alternative, the variant words are in the poem. They're not on the bottom, like little footnotes. They're in the poem. They're on the line of the poem. They're not, it, it's not an alternative. It is part of the poem. It's like hyperlinked. It's like she was preconceiving, you know, the digital age by doing that, making these poems processional, dynamic, right? Um, and, but what also people have started to do is to look at the poems as visual objects, as works of art, not just what the poems are saying, but how she shapes the words and how she crosses her T's and how she puts shapes the whole poem on the page. This has become really important. Once the manuscripts were out there and the manuscript books were published in, in 1981, but they weren't available to everybody until 2013. Mm -hmm. So this has changed absolutely the way, we're, in fact, what the what critics are saying is that we're now unediting Dickinson. We are in the process of unediting her, freeing her from all the editorial, most male voices or, you know, or hands so that we can get a sense of what she actually wanted us to look at, which she, to me, I, the fascicles seem to be, you know, how could you not see that as her, if I don't want to talk about authorial intention, but any little evidence we have of what Dickinson wanted 
That's it. Tom, did you are you waving your hands or are you just agreeing with me? <laughs> I, I just want to see somebody write an article called The Needle Versus the Press. The and the, 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 the needle, she sewed them together, deliberately yeah. sewed them together, and that didn't count. It's like Hester Prynne in the Scarlet Letter. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, most of them, Ameri you know, it's here. Hester Prynne, the Puritan, sewing that A to beautify that A, making it into an angel when everybody thought it was adultery, right? It's so, No, that's you're so right. interesting though, because I love that as well, because it's kind of, um, you know, so much negativity about digital age and everything, but it's um, really reminiscent for me of stuff that's happening in early modern studies, because I do Renaissance stuff mostly with women writers, where you are getting these incredible um, transcriptions and photographs of their work it's actually the um, folder has done it. Um, mm. I think it's of um, Hester Poulter. I think it's with the, I think it's the folder, maybe not. Um, but anyway, they like all these projects are kind of sprouting up where you have these incredible, it's a similar thing where it's a manuscript work and it's a collection of poems um, yeah. and they seem to be in some kind of order, but people have kind of talked a lot about she rearranges them to put them into a published book later as part of a much bigger work that's a romance as well. So that's the kind of form that was held up for a long time, but there's been some amazing work done about these. Um, yeah, like it's kind of non-textual things or not straight text, like you were saying with the superscription of the um, variants with Dickinson. So she has this strange symbol at the end and people have like found patterns through it that they think structure the way the poem's are meant to be read. And obviously in an edition, that's like a printed edition, that's just edited out most of the time. Um, right. So yeah, it's like a great thing, isn't it? That we can see these texts in their yeah, original form, that unediting I think is a really positive thing to come out of all this digital stuff. Really and positive. amplifying voices that haven't been. Right. Yeah. Apparently there, people have done some work about um, circles of Quaker women in, in England in the 16th and 17th century who shared poetry and writing and would publish, you know, kind of, you know, do this kind of coterie publishing and circulate their manuscripts, right? Um, because yeah, they knew is that. that um, little Gidding, is that it? Have you? Well, you yes. Well, or is that Gidding. something else? No, but that no, that's something else. But but oh, in little Gidding, didn't they they took Bibles apart and made little collages right that's out of it, the Bible. Yeah, because I was saying with your cutting thing, it's kind of it's yeah. become quite trendy in early one studies. Think about cutting as a kind of writing and like collaging and right, so little, kind of like a remix now with music. That's right. Little that's Gidding right. was was not Quakers. Little Gidding was um, no, it was perfectly yeah. orthodox yeah. okay. C of E. You know, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but there are, but there, people have been, but there are groups of Quaker women that circulate, you know, manuscripts. I mean, I'm really kind of fascinated with this, that we don't consider that publication. Mm -hmm. And so in Dickinson studies, I've really learned to distinguish between print pub publication and print publication, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think she published her work. She sent her poems out to hundreds of people, but, but because she had, could control that. But she knew that in commercial print publication, she could not control the, the body of her work. Okay, I think there's so many projects that can uh, come out of this. <laughs> we could be here all night. Um, I just wanted to pass on a, a thank you too from Cass, Kathy Hazra, who said, thank you for this exquisite and fantastic paper. Um, so um, uh, I think she's somewhere in the, in the crowd there. Um, and thank you. I think um, we're sort of time's up, uh, time for a gin and tonic or a cup of tea. Um, <laughs> You know, we are in England now, <laughs> in Britain. Francesca, sorry, just before we go, um, before I let you do the close remark, I just want to plug that we are doing the same thing next week with another amazing speaker. Um, yeah. It's Miles P. Greer from Cooney in New York, um, and he's going to be speaking on stigma, Othello, and marking uh, as a racialized metaphor and how that develops. Um, 
but yeah sorry back to you Francesca yes. <laughs> good promotion definitely and and uh, you know um it's been a fantastic um session I've really enjoyed it it's opened my mind I'm gonna um rush off and go and get some of these poems to have a look because it, it is not my field but um absolutely fascinating thank you very much and I hope um your the rest of your semester goes um fantastically well and we don't lock down again so you get you might get stuck here for the whole year <laughs> you know that's can't be that bad um but uh thank <laughs> Thank you so much, Ivy, and thank you to Tom in support you. too. Um, uh, really appreciate um, your time and uh, fascinating talk. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it was great to see everybody and uh, see you next time at, at the next session. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.